only on May 19A, a day before the passengers and crew of Zamzam landed in France. The British announced that the ship was late. Despite the seeming calmness of the enemy, we had no illusions about the consequences of our blow. Atlantis, obeying the requirements of the moment, went at full speed into less inhabited waters, in the vastness of which we wished to dissolve. But the hunt had already begun, and a few days after parting with the Dresden, our sleep was interrupted by the alarm signal, unexpected, loud, piercing. Mm. Take your places according to the combat schedule. Through the heavy slumber I could hear the stomping of many feet on the deck overhead. What the hell was going on? Not quite awake yet. I tried to pick out individual sounds from the noise around me, and my hand was already reaching for the phone. The visit in the bridge. Mertiu vessels sighted. I rolled off the bunk and rushed to the door. Two ships. Even though I was extremely tired, I immediately realized what it could mean. At best, it could be a vessel so important that it is heavily armed and coming under the escort of a warship. At worst, it is two warships. For us, both options were unattractive. I flew up to the bridge where Roggy was already standing beside the watch officer. They picked a good time, he muttered. The Atlantis swayed slowly on the waves with its engines at a standstill. The only thing that broke the silence of its solitude was the creak that the hull made as the ship tumbled from one side to the other. The noise caused by the alarm had subsided, but only now the silence on Atlantis was not sleepy. It was the tense calm of men ready for anything. I looked carefully into the distance. Yes, unfortunately, there was no mistake. There were indeed two ships and each had a pyramidal superstructure, unmistakably identifying it as a military vessel. Both were coming at high speed straight at us. It was not a pleasant sight, and it destroyed the vestiges of sleep in my eyes and the sluggishness in my brain. Every nerve went to work, becoming part of my self-preservation apparatus. I began to calculate automatically the distance, the speed of approach, and our chances of survival. The latter seemed minimal. Up to this point, the night had been dark by South Atlantic standards. But now the moon appeared in the sky behind the approaching silhouettes, presenting itself to us in its cold splendor. It broke through the frowning heavy clouds and shone directly at us like an enemy ship's searchlight. A bad omen. Yet this apparent obstruction had its good points. The moonlight, creating its own shadows in the vast sea of shadows, would hinder rather than aid the enemy's forward lookouts. It would blur the colors of the Atlantis, covering it with gray, black, and white spots, dressing our ship in a kind of camouflage of sea and sky. Gun. Number one, ready. Gun number two, ready. Gun number three, ready. Netopedo tubes, ready. We listened to these reports while standing on the bridge and watching the enemy approach. Launch the machines. Roggy ordered. Launch the machines, I repeated, involuntarily lowering my voice. We couldn't move too fast. The sheer haste would give us away. We had to move out slowly sideways, another look through the binoculars, and another. No, it can't be true, I strained my eyes. Was I right? Behind me, someone whistled and mutter. Next stop, paradise. Bidrog hummed enigmatically, and I realized I wasn't wrong. There were only two ships in the world that even remotely resembled the first of the approaching giant warships. Nelson or Rodney. The ship astern of this steel monster could be easily identified, at least its class. It was an aircraft carrier. Two alternative possibilities of our relationship seemed to me likely. They might have known all about us and come close enough to give us an onboard salvo of medium-caliber guns not wanting to waste valuable 16-inch shells on little things like us. Although perhaps they knew nothing about us and stumbled upon us by pure chance. In that case, we were in for the same unpleasant end, only with a slight delay. It would take some time for the enemy to request the secret call sign and find out that we didn't know it. We were going to die heroically, and unfortunately there was no doubt about it. For Fetterland and our 5.9 DM guns, as useless as pea-shooting scarecrows, 
would fire to the last man and the battle flag would be flying on the mast of the Atlantis when we disappeared into the depths of the sea. I grinned crookedly, thinking how this occasion would be presented by our poets from the Ministry of Propaganda. And we waited, dreading to receive a question to which we could not give an answer, and to see the flashes of the enemy's guns. But Mrs. Fortune evidently still considered us her favourites. The aircraft carrier passed so close that we could clearly see the churning water beyond its stern, and wisps of milky white foam whipped up by the propellers flew straight at use. It was so close that we had to seriously consider our options for avoiding a collision. We didn't collide after all, and at the moment of maximum convergence the moon was covered by scattered clouds, covering us with a shimmering shroud that made it difficult for the enemy to see. For a few more minutes we waited tensely. Regardless of the whimsical play of moonlight, they could not fail to notice us. Of this we were sure. Evidently they had decided to play cat and mouse. But the ships passed us and began to move away quickly. It may seem incredible, but the British really didn't see us. Tension eased somewhat. Anxiety was replaced by bewilderment. Rog commanded. Hmm, full speed ahead. Now the most important thing, as far as possible to get away from the unpleasant neighbourhood. Life on the Atlantis began again, people came alive and moved. And then, as chance would have it, our own chimney betrayed us. It threw out a cloud of bright sparks, followed by a tall column of bright red flame. It was soot on fire. We realised that nothing could save us now. It would have been foolish to hope for a second miracle. And yet it happened. In those days, Atlantis was lucky enough to have two miracles a night. The English again did not notice us, and in fifteen minutes, which seemed like an eternity, the uninvited guests disappeared from sight, leaving us to ourselves again. We could only thank fate for all her favours. It was the most unusual encounter we'd had during our entire combat campaign, and most of us thought it was the most frightening. Even when the Atlantis was sunk, we did not experience such hellish tension as we did that summer night. During our pirate career we had to see many ships passing by. One day we were surprised to notice the navigation lights of a steamship accompanied by other obscure lights. What vessel? We beeped, and the mystery ceased. The steamer, part of the French convoy of the Vichy government, was bound for Indochina with the escort of a flotilla of submarines. We wished them a pleasant voyage and left them alone. A peak one situation arose around another vessel, a neutral Swede, which I arrived to check papers and inspect. The documents were in perfect order, so was the cargo. But the captain was clearly agitated, and soon enough I realised why. The reason was a crumpled piece of paper, which I smoothed out and realised that the neutrals were about to broadcast a Q6. I crumpled it up again and handed it to the captain. I believe this is yours. The captain hastily tore up the ill-fated sheet and offered me a glass of scotch with a happy smile. It was a big glass. On January 27 we spotted a liner later identified as the Queen Mary. One of the captives confirmed our suspicions, cheerfully adding that this prey was beyond us. According to him, she was heavily armed. We knew that, usually escorted by a cruiser. We also knew that, and often used this particular route. This last we did not know. We, of course, immediately hurried off to the side. None of us had any suicidal tendencies. I wonder if our prisoner had known that the pocket battleship Skewer was close by. One might say, just around the corner, would he have supplied us with information as obligingly. Later the Queen Mary was withdrawn from this route. In March we made a short excursion into the Mozambique Channel. Here an amusing incident occurred. When asked to stop, for the first time in our practice, a potential victim responded with a perplexed signal. What's wrong? Do you need help? The vessel turned out to be French, and we, having answered that we were all right, left it alone. Such episodes, not to mention, of course, the meeting with the Nelson and Arch Royal later it, turned out that the aircraft carrier was called Eagle, remained in our memory for a long time. A general fatigue came over us. We had been engaged in the business of destruction for too long, 
and it took its toll on the morale of the crew. The romantic aura that had originally surrounded our activities had long since faded, erased by the memory of the victims, meeting face to face with prisoners every day. We got to know the enemy much better than participants in grandiose, but impersonal battles on the ground or massive aerial bombardments. We felt that our trade, while beneficial to the country's military potential, had many negative sides. And although we tried to minimise losses among merchant seamen as much as possible, there was no escaping the facts. We killed more than 60 sailors doing their job. It is extremely unpleasant to look into the face of the enemy when he is dying. It is much easier to use means that allow you to see what is happening from afar periscope sights angle meters. It is very difficult to listen to the enemy's voice telling about a distant home, about peaceful life, about the discomfort you have to share together. It is much easier to hear his voice distorted with rage on the radio or read newspaper articles. It would be dishonest to say that we were overcome by remorse, that we had lost faith in the rightness of our cause and betrayed our country. We were far from that. We had a job to do, and we kept doing it. And I will not say that the thought of sixty dead sailors turned us away from our goal, or seemed too high a price to pay for success. On the vast continental fronts, in towns and villages, millions of soldiers, hundreds of thousands of civilians were dying or near death, and in circumstances far worse than those of our so-called opponents. And our death, if it comes to us, will not be the same as on the ground. It turned out that all our fights, often separated in time by weeks and in space by hundreds of miles, took on a special personal significance. When people confront the forces of nature every minute, a kind of blood kinship sooner or later developed between them. Common trials always bring kinship, even with an adversary. This sentiment was not shared by our compatriots back home. Having the privilege of listening not only to our radio programs but also to British ones, I was shocked by the amount of hatred released. Meanwhile, I was extremely interested in English language political broadcasts and BBC news bulletins. Trying to remain objective, I concluded that in broadcasting to their people and allies in Europe, the British were at least trying to stick to the facts. I could not say the same of the broadcasts which the party fed to our countrymen. Such broadcasts spread the wildest and most groundless rumours. Their absurdity was obvious to anyone with even a partial knowledge of information. One of the rumours that constantly irritated Rog and the rest of the Atlantis officers was the claim that the Arch Royal had been sunk. Today I can already say that, at the same time as the Ministry of Propaganda was making unsubstantiated claims about the ignominious death of the carrier, the Berlin Admiralty was providing us with intelligence information about its alleged whereabouts. Deception cannot help but affect the morale of people who are ordered to listen only to their own radio and rely on it unreservedly, knowing, as in this case, that such claims are not only baseless but outright false. We questioned other information, much of which I have no doubt was true, and yet we did everything in our power to keep it from the team. Such was our dedication or our desire to maintain our self-respect by resorting to deception. The Arch Royal aircraft carrier scandal soon became widely known and generated much justifiably cynical commentary. At this stage of the war, we were not forced to submit to strict party discipline a discipline that later shackled the ranks of the armed forces. We were so autonomous of being utter words, comparatively inaccessible, that I could refer to the BBC and the radio of neutral countries when compiling daily news bulletins for the command. I was my own census. Before bringing information to the team's attention, I likely trimmed what British propaganda offered, but used their news without distorting anything. News was vital to us and if we couldn't or wouldn't get it, it was only fair to get it from other sources. That was my point of view. Later, however, our government decided that such attempts were insufficient to set the sailors right. They had to be made to imbibe the philosophy of the new order, and this subject was too sacred to be entrusted to amateurs. Political officers therefore appeared on many ships, making the situation much more difficult as many actions were now discussed behind the back of the man who had committed them. 
It was thanks to the BBC that the Atlantis News Service learned two news stories, far ahead of Gobel's propaganda network. I won't say we were the first to get the information, but we were the first to publicize it, that's for sure. First came the news of the loss of the Ketty Breivik, our prized tanker, and the Coburg to which he was transferring fuel in seldom visited waters off the Cycles, where they were overtaken by the cruisers Leander and Canberra. Then came the news of the loss of our fellow raider penguin ship 33. It was attacked and sunk in the Indian Ocean. The German ship sank without lowering the battle flag and did not cease fire until the last second. All but 30 members of the crew perished. Penguin lived a short but colourful life. He often managed to come out unscathed from seemingly hopeless situations. Leaving Germany in June, Penguin was first forced to get away from the pursuit of the British submarine, and then the British auxiliary cruiser. It operated on the Australian trade routes and sent home prisoners. 520 men were sent on a tanker captured as a prize. No one doubted the true valour of the officers and crew of the Penguin, and we sincerely grieved the loss. This tragedy became personal to us because it affected a ship we knew well, which was on the same mission as the Atlantis. Its crew was doing the same job and experiencing the same hardships as we were, and its fate made us once again reflect on our own. But barely had we had time to get over the shock of the loss of the Penguin before the BBC broadcast another report of another battle that had a huge impact on our future plan. It had been sunk by the Bismarck. The report of the event that shook England was made over the ship's communications and generated almost no enthusiasm among the Atlantis officers. No, we of course proclaimed a toast to the success of the Bismarck, but still we were sad. We knew very well that the cruiserhood was the pride of Great Britain, and the Royal Navy would now throw all its forces into battle to exact revenge, no matter how many ships it lost in the process. In his war memoirs, Churchill recorded, Its loss was a heavy blow, but knowing how many ships were now after the Bismarck, I had no doubt that sooner or later we would get it. We officers thought so too, and it is impossible to describe the strange mixture of hope and despair with which we listened to the accounts of one of the most dramatic episodes of the war at sea, the details of the last battle of the Hood. After the Bismarck had received the decisive blow from the Dorsetshire, we observed a minute's silence, and even the most steadfast and resolute of us were in the grip of pessimism. The crew were depressed, and we again appreciated the wisdom of the captain in taking the ship far out into the Atlantic. The loss of the Bismarck meant a lot to us also for purely personal, selfish reasons. In May we had to head for home. We now knew that there was no way for us to get there, because the North Atlantic was a hornet's nest. The movement of the battleship entailed the presence of many supply and weather reconnaissance vessels at sea, and there was also the deployment of our submarine fleet. Having analysed the situation, we realised that now that the presence of Bismarck does not bind the other battleships and invariably accompanying cruisers and destroyers, the British will start hunting for other ships, servants of the victim. And if we head into the North Atlantic, will fall right into their hands. The clear the lower deck. Og assembled the crew and announced the news. We will not break through to Europe, but head in the other direction, go out into the Pacific, round Cape Horn, and when the alarm subsides, tension began to take its toll. Back, but that would mean many more months at sea. Except for the brief stay on Kerguelen, the crew had not been ashore for over a year. The blow was hard on the sailors. Roggy realised this and made this decision only because he saw no other option. Sixty percent of the crew were married men, many of them reservists with peaceful occupations unrelated to the sea. They were genuinely disturbed by reports of bombing and the effect of the blockade on the lives of the German population. It is hardly surprising, therefore, that Roggy's decision did not meet with the approval of the crew but the captain's word was law. The turn to the east was preceded by a short meeting, or rather a brief meeting, during which Rog gave the navigator and me the orders we were to carry out. He had no intention of backing down. I'm sorry, gentlemen, but my decision is final, he said. 
I realize that this is a heavy blow to the men, and it is not a heavy blow to me. But our duty to save the ship and continue to operate on the enemy's trade communications. Rajesh, as usual, had practical considerations. We still have more than half of the ammunition. Atlantis was in excellent technical condition and had enough fuel to not depend on outside help for several months. Command suggested going to Dakar as an alternative. But Rog disagreed, saying that you go in and you don't come out. He did not want to see Atlantis indefinitely stuck at Anchorage. Our appearance in the Pacific, he explained, would confuse the enemy, cause additional ship movements, and most likely provide an opportunity to find additional casualties off the Australian coast. But then what? Well, Rocky grinned crookedly. We can return to the South Atlantic in the fall, and make an attempt to break through to the north in the winter. Atlantis changed course and headed east, destroying Rabaul and Trafalgar. On June 17, we sank the Tottenham, commanded by Captain Woodcock. With a cargo of ammunition on board, the ship exploded like a volcano. Five days later, on June 22, we sank the Balzac, depriving the Allies of a cargo of 4,000 tons of rice, much beeswax and miscellaneous general cargo ranging from canned beans to sacks of mail. Shortly afterward, we transferred the prisoners to another ship and were again on our own. We were heading east, east all the time. Above us, the sky was as gloomy as our mood, and all around us, the waves were raging, and it was necessary to calm their fury. With We passed Prince Edward Island. We passed New Amsterdam. The gradients flew like bullets, and the rain poured down in torrents, hitting us as hard as the merciless sea. Our life became a never-ending nightmare, and we could only dream of sleep. For days on end, thunder rumbled in the sky, a fitting accompaniment to the storm scene. Standing on the bridge in such weather, one involuntarily begins to remember legends about sea ghosts, about the flying Dutchman, doomed to eternal wandering on the seas. Sometimes, if the mood was very gloomy and life seemed absolutely hopeless, I began to imagine that we were not living people, but also just ghosts from an ancient legend, and our Atlantis was a long-ago sunken ship, condemned by someone's evil will to eternal wandering. Overwork had weakened the restraining centers, but it manifested itself differently in everyone. Some, like myself, made up nonsense, while others, with less strong nerves, were suddenly seized by a mania of suspicion. They began to believe that everyone around them hated them, maybe even plotting murder. Lost in stormy latitudes, we experienced the inevitable consequences of our long sea voyage, with its alternating periods of excitement and boredom, our detachment from normal life, our too small world. All this was accumulating somewhere inside us unnoticed in the form of a kind of explosive mass and the weather might well have been the spark that was missing for the explosion. Day after day, month after month, we were surrounded by the same environment and the same people. And now, it seemed, year after year we were to see the same faces and do the same things. We realized this to the fullest extent, and now the little things that had previously gone unnoticed became intolerably irritating, and the never-silent voice of the sea, previously soothing and calming, now more and more often began to sound a frightening crescendo. Hitherto we had been constantly accompanied by the gulls and small birds that live on the African coast, but now both the gulls and the black and white doves, so numerous at the Cape of Good Hope, had left us. Only the albatross was left with us circling above the mast, and looking at it, I began to believe that the ancient legends were true and that this proud bird really contained the soul of the dead captain who could not part with the sea. The symbol of the most disgusting weather in these bleak days became for us the figure of a forward lookout dressed in a yellow cloak on the hull, looking out for icebergs. Another sign of the times was the increased flow of casualties in the infirmary. People went there with bruises, broken fingers and limbs, the inevitable companions of any storm. More, more. Roggy once said, I've decided to put the crew on vacation. Vacation? I asked in surprise. But where to? To the nearest ice flow? No. We will organize a vacation home. 
I waited in silence, realizing that Rog would give me all the information I needed to know. He must have a trump card up his sleeve. We can't let them go on shore leave, so we must give them leave on board. Seven days each. For that period they will be relieved of all duties, even the need for discipline. Unless, of course, there's an emergency. Please take care, Lieutenant, to make the vacation room attractive. I smiled. Roggy's suggestion would no doubt surprise and delight the crew. Today, looking back, I'm sure that it was this new system that helped us avoid the unpleasant conflicts that had arisen on other ships between officers and crew as a result of change, hardship, and detachment from home. When we finished equipping the vacation centre, it took on a remarkably attractive appearance. Photos of relatives on the walls, a few landscapes, models of ships. The reaction of the crew could not fail to please. The first batch that went on vacation were constantly coming up with new details to enhance the illusions. A delegation to see you, Mr. Captain. Delegation. Roggy was surprised. Outside the cabin door stood six vacationers dressed in the best they could pick from the trophies. Smart suits, bright shirts, short sports jackets. We came to say goodbye, they said. In their hands they held suitcases labelled with the labels of the best resorts and the most expensive hotels in Germany. Later the captain received an unexpected message. Having a wonderful time. The weather is gorgeous. Generally speaking, it was not at all easy to maintain discipline by so-called traditional methods. Roggy's methods were much more effective. I won't say that we haven't had any failures. I'm sorry. I can't stay long enough to clear the tables. I'm in a hurry to go on duty, the signalman said in unison and left the mess hall with the air of importance that annoyed their comrades. They had every reason to be proud of their accomplishments as lookouts, but that was no reason. The skinny sailor, who had always been viciously sarcastic, pounded his fist on the table with all his might. Boys, he shouted, addressing his table mates. I've had enough. Who the hell do these signalmen think they are? Personally, I'm not going to clean up after them. Let's just leave it at that. There were voices of approval in response. Let them do the dirty work themselves. There's no need to slack off. In the midst of the outrage, the foreman appeared. Oh, take this table away, and quickly. There was silence. The foreman looked around impatiently, hurrying back to his many duties. What are you waiting for? I gave the order. Silence. Didn't you hear? He roared with instant anger. Remove the table at once. Several men made a hesitant movement toward the table, but stopped. A scrawny sailor intervened. It's the signal men's table, he explained. Let them clean it up. It doesn't matter whose it is. Clean it up. The sailor glanced glumly at the petty officer, then looked back at his comrades. I won't. What? The petty officer couldn't believe his ears. I won't, the sailor repeated firmly. Neither will I, added his comrade. The officer on duty came in. What's the matter, petty officer? And the petty officer had to explain why there were frowning sailors standing around the table, which had only be cleaned, and looking around angrily. Did you hear the petty officer's orders? The officer asked. Yes, I did. And you refused to obey it. That's right. Well, thought the officer, realizing that several dozen sailors were watching the developments. There was only one way out. Mer guardhouse, take these men into custody. Being the chairman of the court-martial, I was confronted with a very delicate problem. And how delicate, I realized only after delving into our military law. Two sailors were charged with mutiny. That meant they could be shot or hanged. We could let them go, but we couldn't do that, no matter how harmless their actions were and no matter what apologies they made since their guilt was obvious. To let them go, to show leniency by allowing them to remain at large among their comrades on a voyage such as ours, would not only be wrong from an official point of view, but dangerous from a moral point of view. I endeavoured to find what the English call the golden mean, and could not. It's a deferred punishment, I announced in despair, and set off to study the volumes of the law. 
There it was, an archaic clause. Bring in the prisoners. The sailors were brought in, and I solemnly announced the sentence. May, three months in the fortress. The imprisonment in a fortress used to be applied to officers of noble birth and was a form of honourable imprisonment. But the sentence sounded impressive enough to nip in the bud, the desire to emulate the offenders. It impressed the crew and even the signalmen. Less, three months in the fortress. Commends marvelled as the men were led away. But that's impossible to fulfil. Hmm, so quite right, I muttered. The incident occurred early in our voyage, and we were able to transfer the guilty men under guard to a supply ship returning to Germany. Only a year later did I learn that our expectations of what would happen back home, when the command read the highly unusual sentence, had been more than justified. Im imprisonment in a fortress. A fortress for two sailors? Did they there think we had so many fortresses? Urgent consultations between historians and admiralty lawyers ensued, after which it was decided to cancel my sentence on the grounds that it was impossible to carry out. Instead, the lads went to prison for a fortnight, though why they were subjected to this punishment I never understood. I wonder what Messrs. Gilberti Sullivan would have said about it. It all seems funny now, but at the time it was very important for us to restrain the development of even the slightest symptoms of mutual animosity. Such things are extremely contagious and spread quickly, especially in the confined world of the ship, where even a simple irritation can quickly escalate into a general crisis. Both of our cases of disciplinary action against prisoners, therefore, involve the refusal of sailors to treat their officers with proper deference. Speech is like we are all prisoners now, and therefore equal, and he is no better than I am should, in our firm conviction, have been nipped in the bud. But I've already mentioned that. There was a problem in our team, which many would call a big problem, related to the discomfort inevitably experienced by men who have been deprived of female company for long periods of time. At first we feared that the presence of female prisoners on board would exacerbate the situation. Fortunately, this turned out not to be the case. In any case, there were no open conflicts. Other difficulties did arise, however, and the first of them, and a serious one at that, occurred during the New Year's Eve celebration on the Kerguelen. We authorised the performance of an impromptu cabaret in which sailors dressed as maidens danced. They wore bling and dresses found on captured ships. Life proved that this was an unwise decision, and within days afterward the court-martial had to deal with two cases of homosexuality. But on the whole, the problem that had received so much attention ashore had not reached the proportions that should have been feared. We were heading for the Antipodes Islands, and Rog, taking every opportunity to boost the morale of the crew, had devised. In addition to the vacation system, a series of disciplinary measures designed to keep people busy at all times. Murdy, Captain's Inspection. The rumour instantly travelled throughout the living quarters. What here? When? In the very centre of the watery desert. Why? And it's none of your business why, the petty officer shouted, clean yourself and the room immediately. At the appointed hour, Rogge appeared in full uniform and with awards. He was accompanied by me, also all gilded. It seemed to me that a shimmering glow emanated from us. He conducted the inspection with a thoroughness and scrupulousness, that would have been the envy of the most hard-headed stubborn stubborn. This ritual had been put into practice on Atlantis, and though naturally not popular with the ship's laser bones, it kept us from slacking off and getting down. We were constantly washing, cleaning or scrubbing, stacking or unfolding something. We were painting and stripping paint, doing endless training and mastering related specialties. In this way we had absolutely no free time, which meant that none of us had the luxury of showing discontent, giving in to temptation, or insulting a comrade. So the 370 men were back again from the Antarctic cold zone to the tropical heat zone. Soon Atlantis was to meet another victim, which was destined to be its last. The final victim. Nice looking things, aren't they? said Cross, and handed his comrade one of the small grotesque idol figures from Bailey. 
not all the members of the boarding party agreed with him. Hmm, they will bring us bad luck, said another sailor. It's a bad omen. Hey, I throw them overboard, suggested a third. Cross laughed and threw the wooden figurine back into the box, where many more such figurines lay. There were fifty such crates in the holds of the silver plana. We captured this ship on September 10, 1941. This date became significant, the day of our 22nd battle, the day of the capture, which was the during the voyage to the South Pacific. We went around New Zealand in a wide arc, turned around again, and set a course for the Kermadec Islands bathing in the gentle sun, located 700 miles to the north, the unusual route, once called by Rog a blatant contradiction of the mathematical theory that the shortest route between points a and B is a straight line. It was chosen because of the need to bypass the East Indies North Australia screen and mislead the Allied patrol fleet. Choosing a long range throw its maritime version of several thousand miles, Rog was guided by an axiom with which it was very difficult to disagree. It is better to be careful than to drown. Clearly, we all agreed with the captain. At the end of August, we passed the Antipodes Islands, admiring from afar their lonely black rocks and encountering a strange phenomenon that made us call this area the Zone of Silence. For some unknown reason, the airwaves died. Our radio operators could not hear a single sound. They tried to tune in on all possible wavelengths, but with the same result, there was dead silence everywhere, and it seemed as if the radios were simply out of order. What is it? An atmospheric anomaly. We never found out. Atlantis travelled 200 miles before we heard sounds from the outside world again. I'll admit it was not a pleasant sensation, and the nature of this incomprehensible phenomenon was beyond our con. We had gone so far south because of the experience of our colleague, the Orion Raider, which 300 miles south of the Australian coast was detected by the Australian Air Force and pursued. The Orion only managed to slip away by sheer luck. Hearing that the enemy is trying to pepper Lengate's location, the ship took cover in a sudden squall. But we should not have counted on a squall or a patch of thick fog to come along in time. Atlantis couldn't be lucky forever. The silver planner carried a cargo as romantic as could be expected in the midst of sapphire seas, quiet murmuring waters, enchanted islands and quiet lagoons. Besides idols, the ship turned out coffee, wax, vanilla and teak. The air in the hold was heavy and saturated with the aromas of spices and wood. But we weren't interested in romance. 4.5 tons of natural coffee was worth about 700,000 on the continent's black market, and for a moment I regretted those fertile days when romance and commerce went hand in hand. Roggy, too, treated the silver planter with evident affection. It was a very handsome vessel, modern and fast, and captured without bloodshed. It was our best capture since the old Jacob, now renamed Benno, almost a diminutive nickname from its real name. Benno worked faithfully for the Reich, but after a year or two, breaking through the blockade, was severely bombed and sunk off the coast of Spain. Osnick of the ocean. That's what we are. Announced failure with pathos. A rattlesnake. I was surprised. But why? Yes, said Fila, looking out from behind a newspaper delivered from the silver plana, which he was reading in the best chair in the wardroom. That's what our English friends have kindly dubbed us. You'll agree that makes a lot of difference. Hey, for a rattlesnake I sighed, we must seem very unlucky. American radio said recently that thirteen raiders were sunk in these parts. It's like our Reese minister, only in reverse. An administrative officer intervened. Yo, since we've been called a rattlesnake, he said, we'll have to put the sting into action at the first opportunity. Roggy called me in. We need to establish a base, he said, for a new series of operations. I intend to select an island from which we can use a seaplane for reconnaissance flights. Anything it detects, we will pursue and we could all use a walk on the soft sand under the palm trees. Think about it, we're in for a change. I gladly told about all this to my comrades, 
and soon the most fantastic rumors were flying around the ship. When we approached Varna Varna, a one of the Cook Islands, the crew, whose views even under Hitler's regime remained shaped by Hollywood movies, was looking forward to meeting dark-skinned beauties walking along the beach, swaying their hips invitingly. By the way, according to the laws of the genre, they could only wear grass skirts and lush garlands of flowers. And even though brass bands continued to blast military marches on the radio, people heard what they wanted to hear. The tuneful tango guitars and melodious female voices. As the Arado passed a strip of white foam marking a coral reef, Buller shouted, This looks more like the narrow shore of a pond than an island. Not in the eye, as they say, but in the eye. Behind the slender palm trees and the white sandy beach was a vast lagoon that seemed much larger than the ring of land that surrounded it. The lagoon was quiet and marvellously clear, its piercing blue water tempting, beckoning one to plunge into its cool embrace. The airplane descended so low that it almost landed on the water. The pilot and the observer surveyed the surroundings so that on their return they could report to Rog the maximum details. Reed huts, a village, some large structure. My God, exclaimed Buller, it's a bell tower. It was indeed a bell tower, made of palm leaves and crowning a small church. The airplane made a second approach. There were no people in sight on the shore. Do you think they realized who we were and hid? The observer asked. They, they don't get newspapers here. Maybe they thought we were aliens from heaven, Bella laughed. As the plane glided over the village again, a group of men and women emerged from the church. Filled with awe at the noisy bird, they immediately fell down on their knees, probably to show their utmost reverence. Bula was too surprised to marvel at the accuracy of his prophecy. There, muttered the observer, no less stunned by the civility of the locals, but the end of his unprintable phrase was drowned in the roar of the engines. Just at that moment the airplane flew over the reefs, and its crew began to fulfill the main task of the reconnaissance flight. To select a landing site for the landing parties waiting impatiently aboard the Atlantis. As we descended, Boulay felt that the long barreled gun pointed at the shore, looked anachronistic against the background of the local ideal, in any case, a clear overkill. When Fila and I were ordered to prepare for landing, many people were frankly jealous of us. If we had taken all comers with us, the Atlantis would have been as empty as the Maria Celeste. But when faced with the necessity of getting into the small passage between the reefs, over which the waves striking them raised columns of spray in the form of a fountain, we doubted whether we had got such a tidbit. Both the boat and the raft were weightless toys that could be tossed about without any concern for what would be left of them when they collided with the coral reef, which was riddled with menacing protrusions and jagged edges, so we lingered at the threshold for quite a long time and when we got in we looked highly unpretentious. The raft was turned stern first, with the tow end from the boat attached to its bow, and while the boat crew etched the rope, we paddled desperately. By the time we arrived we were wet from head to toe, hardly breathing from fatigue, but feeling absolutely happy as we stepped onto solid ground. The shore beneath our feet was delightfully hard. It was studded with coral fragments that radiated a dazzling luster in the sun. No, we'd gotten a tidbit after all. Hollywood, said Fila, sparkling multicolored coral, coconuts lagoon, palm trees swaying with carved leaves. He sighed dreamily, then perked up. By the way, where are the girls? Wherever the female population of this island was, it was certainly not in the two reed huts near our landing place. Well, we had received orders to search around properly and decided to proceed to fulfill them. From the semi-darkness under the dry grass-covered roof came whining and shrill barking. We looked inside and noticed a litter of ten small puppies in the corner. A bowl stood nearby. The contents were still warm. Okay, I said, they're panicking. We need to do something to calm people down. We left gifts in the hut, knives and the internationally accepted currency. Cigarettes. When we returned the next day, there were about twenty natives waiting on the shore. 
They were a friendly people, headed by a chief and a woman of uncertain years, wearing an apron over a cheerful chintz dress and a wide-brimmed hat covering a face with quite visible whiskers, Furlow whispered admiringly. Hey, how much is Dorothy Lemur nowadays? Ignoring the joker, I bowed and smiled the most gallant smile of which I was capable. The chief and his lady seemed to look at us with approval. The doctor took the Red Cross flag out of his bag, and with the official look of a venerable diplomat from Willem Strassi offered it to the chief. It was accepted. Despite the linguistic difficulties the natives knew half a dozen English words, we soon became friends. When we were able to explain to them that we wanted more coconuts, they readily provided us with five hundred. In return, we gave them several sacks of flour. We were shown the best place to disembark and helped to organize a sort of ferry crossing from shore to the boat. Two ropes were attached to a rubber raft, one from the shore and one from the boat. After that, we were able to manually haul it back and forth. As far as I understood, the only vessel that came to the island was a merchant schooner whose sailors traded goods and groceries for copra. There was nothing like a wharf on Vana Vana and the little church, so lovingly built by these isolated Christians, had not had a white pastor for half a century. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed the belt buckle of one of my men gleaming in the sun, got a tins and the holster at his side. I guess I felt, the next time we came here it would be best to leave our automatic pistols on the Atlantis. Ella, once again returning from a fruitless flight, glanced uneasily at the hoist hook. Returning to Atlantis was always a troublesome affair. First was to slowly bring the Arado up to the ship's traverse while the ship tried to create a pet duck pond, a stretch of calm water. Then came the test of the pilot's acrobatic abilities, who had to climb out of the cockpit and kneel on the outside of the fuselage near the cockpit, resting his toes on it with all his might, as if riding a mule. The next step is juggling, a.k.a. catching the hook dancing something crazy on the end of the steel cable. The final stage is to insert the hook into a special bracket on the fender, it is desirable not to break your head, which, believe me, is very difficult. No difficulties are sometimes not a bad thing, especially if they give you the opportunity to prove yourself. The Mandazer, for example, is still remembered with pleasure. It was thanks to the Arado that the British dry cargo ship was captured in January, but now Buller fed up with the dreary monotony of flying over the deserted waters, sadly recalled this exciting adventure. Then Roggy told Buller that it was possible to knock down the antenna of a dry cargo ship with a heavy hook hanging from the belly of the airplane. Then all that was left was to hold the ship until the raider approached. It was a hell of a job. Then Buller thought that he would never again be drawn to such feats. But now, circling uselessly over the desolate silence of the Pacific, he thought nostalgically of the past. There had been a real war then, British guns one four-inch, Another three inch, and two more machine guns, had opened fire on the Arado, but he had managed to knock down the antenna on the first run, and on the second he had damaged the bridge with bombs, but the British did not stop firing. Although the gunners were wounded, and so warmly said goodbye to him, that the plane only miraculously waited for him to be picked up by a raider. Buddha woke up from his recollection, and in a few seconds was blasting the damn fools who, armed with bamboo poles, was supposed to keep the Arado from crashing into the side of the Atlantis. The pilot was nearly thrown from his not-so-secure perch by the force of the jolt. Our last night on Vana Vana was sad and sentimental. We sat around campfires and sang songs of a distant fatherland, and yet we did not want to leave this peaceful, friendly oasis, replacing it with a desolate, hostile sea. Never had home seemed so far away to us. It was even farther away than paradise. The last night, the ship's scandalized scandalizer was discovered in the thick bushes with a local girl. I got lost, he explained without embarrassment. Last day, I got in a lot of scratches and scrapes when the rope pulling my raft broke, and I was thrown against a coral wall. As the Atlantis departed, Fela and the doctor, standing on deck, waved long to the islanders who remained on shore. The doctor had become especially popular among the island population as he began treating people for a rather rare eye disease to which they were all prone, alleviating the suffering of many. Not a single doctor for hundreds of miles around. 
he lamented. It's barbaric. I wish I had so little time. It's hands hint. Too bad we never got to see the dancing girls, sighed Fela, but the coconuts are good. The Atlantis was slowly heading east, looking for the next victim. But the ocean was empty. Many of us were secretly glad. We were under the sway of a strange sense of detachment from the world. It had come to us before, but in these godforsaken places it was intensified. We approached Henderson Island, one of a group of high volcanic Pitcairn Islands, famous for the legend of the bounty. The cliffs were so high and steep that we could climb up only by grasping the protruding roots of trees, and the vegetation at the top was so dense that after going only twenty metres into the interior of the island, I had to climb a tree to find my way back. On Henderson Island we found no sign of animals, let alone people, but we did find a signpost. The sun and wind whitened letters. Henderson Island belongs to King George V. This information was slightly out of date, as was the inscription below. It said a British cruiser had called at the island. We thanked fate that we were more than ten years away from such an important event. And on board the Atlantis, Fela never gave up trying to keep up the morale of his colleagues. At least that's what he called his petty hooliganism. Once he filled the administrative officer's cabin with toilet paper, there were several thousand rolls of it. Another time he placed a specimen of algae that he found curious. The specimen he liked was at least twenty metres long, wet, slippery, and gave off a rather unpleasant odour. The administrative officer was very attached to his canary, and Fela took the opportunity to steal the bird, placing a jar in the cage instead. In a narrow world, trifles to which no one usually pays attention, considering them too insignificant to waste time, have a habit of assuming an exaggerated importance. An example was the case of the ship's doctor and the whiskey, which had an unusual flavour. No damn me, Nisso exclaimed, pushing his plate away and standing up indignantly. I've never been so insulted before. Come on, doctor. The peacekeepers tried to remedy the situation. It didn't mean anything wrong. But Ryle wasn't going to calm down. Hey, if there's anything wrong with this whiskey, you should blame the makers, not me. Ryle had a point and he thought he had every reason to. As the ship's doctor, he was in charge of the liquor supply, and he decided that doubts about the quality of the liquor were seen to mount to doubts about its honesty. But, doctor, protested the blushing culprit of the scandal, I didn't think. Ryle said no more and walked proudly out of the wardroom. From that time he began to avoid society, even in his cabin rarely appeared, and we were worried thinking that he took complaints about the undoubtedly strange taste of his favourite whisky on his own account, and then rumours began to spread around the ship. The doctor was busily engaged in something in a dark cubby hole where we had a soda machine, periodically conferring with the sailor who operated it and constantly analysing the quality of the water. Eventually he reappeared in public and solemnly announced, Whisky has nothing to do with it. It's all about the water. I'm trying a new formula right now, mixing a small amount of seawater with drinking water. When, after another series of tests, the doctor checked the results of his experiments on us, we couldn't help but admit that the whiskey tasted excellent. This is how inconsequential little things can lead to great scientific discoveries. After all, if Newton hadn't been offended by an apple, who knows? We were to meet the comet, a radar which, with the connivance of the Russians, had passed through the Bering Strait, and was now operating on the sea lanes between Japan and the west coast of America. I don't know why, but there had always been a rivalry between our ships. And now that Ison, commander of the comet, had been promoted to the rank of admiral, we decided to mark the occasion with cheerful congratulations. So when we saw the flagship, which was of smaller size than ours, we greeted it with a gun salute, hoisted saluting flags, and rog. Dressed in immaculate ceremonial uniform, went on a courtesy visit. All in all, it was just as if our raider had met the Bismarck. Alas, we were quite in vain in our merriment and anticipation of amusement. Ison took our ostentatious signs of attention for granted, and his consciousness of his own importance might have been envied by the commander-in-chief of the German Navy himself. A much more interesting event for us was the appearance of the navigator Kamenz, who had circumnavigated the globe via Japan, Russia and Germany. It was indeed a momentous day for all of us, and when information was received that Kamenz, arriving by submarine, should receive inoculations against typhoid and cholera, we decided to organise for this operation the appropriate decorations. 
It was no secret of Comenz's dislike of the Brotherhood of Freemasons, and when he entered the wardroom he was confronted by three figures wrapped in hooded cloaks with silk aprons over them. They were waiting for their victim, at the head of a table dimly lighted by candles. The rest of the gathering, dressed in the garb of Ku Klux Klan members, stood silently in the shadows. The two doctors and their assistant had to work hard before they injected our Odysseus with the right dose. The morale of the crew soared to unprecedented heights when word got out that we were to round Cape Horn. We were aware that the South Atlantic was frequented by enemy vessels, but it was still a journey back through familiar waters. Once in the South Atlantic, we could feel ourselves on the threshold of home. We took the long circular route, the way of the old sailing ships, rounded the Falkland Islands, passed north of the South Shetland Islands, past the cold fog and ice of Antarctica. Then we turned north. We had one last leg of the journey left to make, the one we believed would take us home. Proceed to Narcissus Flower Point for U-68 fuel transfer. Roggy read the radiogram aloud and turned to me. We had a job coming up. Then he leaned over the map, looking for the point we had indicated. They're crazy out there, he muttered, completely out of their minds. A few minutes later, a reply was sent from Atlantis. It would be suicide for us to proceed to this point. The commander of U-68 was no less indignant, backing up Roggy's protest with a short I agree. I do not know what considerations guided the high command, but the rendezvous point for us was chosen right on the very busy route between Freetown and Cape Town. Eventually we were offered another point, but it was also located in an area too frequently travelled for the job to be done without fear. The fuel transfer process was therefore accompanied by a rush and nervousness on the part of both participants. Thank goodness it all came off safely, I said as the U-68 disappeared from view. As it turned out, however, I had rejoiced too soon. We had not yet had time to lie down on our previous course when the next radiogram arrived. Proceed to Lily 10 Flower Point for you in 1-2-6 fuel transfer. Where is this Lily 10? Roggy asked. Commens made a quick calculation. Here, he said, and put a neat cross on the map. Right here, he repeated confidently. Today I might well say that even then I was overcome by misgivings, that the words Lily 10 had inspired a vague anxiety. But there was none of that. Point ten, we stared at the little pencil cross on the map, and it didn't occur to either of us that it might mark the grave of Atlantis. Find Licher Cruiser in sight. Find Licher Cruiser in sight. Find Licher Cruiser in sight. And immediately afterward a shrill alarm, which within seconds turned the calmly sailing ship into a fine-tuned fighting mechanism. The men took their places according to the battle schedule to take part in their last fateful battle. Find it a cruiser in sight. Find it a cruiser in sight. This shout, which came to us over the telephone connecting the observation post and the bridge, was transformed into a loud alarm signal that broke the sleepy silence that enveloped the ship's rooms. The officer of the watch had pressed the alarm button. This signal was the harbinger of the end of Atlantis, a sign that we all knew could not one day not appear. We did not doubt it but we carefully pushed such thoughts into the farthest corners of our brains, preferring to live today and not to think about the future, especially such an unpleasant one. The early morning of November 22, 1941 was dull but clear. We stood at the rendezvous point with UM 126 transferring fuel to our grey counterpart, a submarine that had a great mission ahead of her. There were no other worries that morning and we allowed ourselves to relax a little. The South Atlantic was quiet and calm. A city street is like that at the end of the night, when it has not yet been hit by the morning traffic, when people hurrying about their business have not yet begun to trample fallen autumn leaves into the mud. I yawned widely and stepped out onto the deck and looked around. The UN-126 was off our side, with a fuel line thrown over to the boat. It looked as if the big ship was transfusing the small, skittish submarine with its own blood. There were voices coming from Roggy's cabin. The submarine commander had come aboard, and now the men were exchanging rumours and information over a glass of sherry. Representatives of the rival units chatted with casual cordiality, like friends meeting in peacetime. A sentimental song was heard from somewhere. A quiet, peaceful morning. I had a cold one, though, and considering that I had not slept well and could not wake up, it seemed even colder. For the umpteenth time I had a dream that had been a regular occurrence since leaving the Coral Atoll. Call it what you will, anticipation or subconscious fear. 
but the dream was always the same. I saw a British cruiser appearing on my left side, with three trumpets and a long hull. At this point I usually woke up and didn't know how the encounter ended. The watchman smiled wryly and wished me a good morning. Um, thank goodness the panic of yesterday is over, he said. He was talking about the excitement caused by the trouble with our seaplane. After a routine reconnaissance flight, the Arado made an unsuccessful landing on the water and promptly sank. It was a heavy loss. We lost our eyes at just the wrong moment. So it is hardly surprising that Rog, who already did not consider the neighbourhood safe, was extremely dissatisfied. What's the use of talking? There's nothing we can do about it, I sighed. But it seems much more peaceful to do. There was a light breeze on the deserted deck. There were only a few people here, finishing their work. The others preferred to stay in the warm rooms. Small lazy waves rolled on the smooth surface of the sea. The water seemed grey before dawn. But we knew that in the sunlight it would change colour and become blue. For a while, and not for the first time, I forgot about the war, admiring the picture of the birth of the day over the ocean. We seldom had the opportunity to contemplate, and being in a feverish hurry, we simply did not notice the majestic beauty around us. The coffee was good, and even the smell of fuel that accompanied the transfer process did not seem unpleasant, but seemed an integral part of the overall picture. Sky, wind, and sea. And then there was a shuck. Senlicher cruiser in sight. Fiendlicher cruiser in sight. Then the events flashed by like a kaleidoscope. One second, the pipeline was disconnected. Another second, and the submarine commander ran out on deck, rushing back to his ship. Too late. His young chief mate reacted so quickly that only bubbles and foam remained where the submarine had just been. UN-26 was gone, leaving its commander seething with anger on our deck. Bastards. Goddamn bastards. Rushing in without even seeing the enemy. But U-126 had another enemy to fear, and we soon found out. And we were always so proud of our ability to spot the enemy first. A seaplane from the cruiser appeared. It was circling around. Pilots were photographing the Atlantis. Shoot that pig down, shouted one of the sailors, but Roggy shook his head. Walrus continued to circle, an annoying buzzing insect, a belligerent wasp with enough venom for everyone. But Roggy did not give the order to open fire. At full speed our boat came up, like a frightened chicken rushing under the wing of a mother hen. As it neatly lined up against the side of the boat, someone shouted from the deck, This is not a good time for guests. There followed a short meeting at which Rog gave the necessary orders. He was very anxious, although outwardly he remained as calm as ever. He was planning one last desperate bluff. We'll try to stall for time, he said. Let's try to pass ourselves off as English. A futile intention. Absolutely not. There was a chance that the cruiser, believing our bluff, would approach, and then we'd have a chance to use torpedoes. There's a submarine, Roggy reminded us. We have to give her time to get away. In short, we'll stall until the last possible moment. And remember, the guns must be silent. I pointed my binoculars at the Devonshire and marvelled at the magnificent ship. The waves breaking from her bow enlivened the smooth surface of the sea and gave an idea of the speed at which she was moving. But I quickly stopped admiring the graceful classic silhouette of a British warship when I saw the deck guns, which were too many for my taste. Their muzzles were pointed at us, the cruiser was heading in our direction, and unless a miracle happened, very soon it would be all over. Our opponent introduced himself from a great distance, briefly but very convincingly, thus making it clear what the future held for us. The Devonshire sailors were clearly not willing to waste any time. A bright orange flash appeared against the grey hull. An eight-inch shell roared over our mast with the roar of a speeding train and plummeted into the water. Another flash and the same shell fell into the water in front of the Atlantis's bow, raising a high fountain of grey. The enemy's intentions were clear, now it was up to us. Machines stop. It's the familiar hum and vibration of the engine subsided, and Atlantis was enveloped in silence, taking each man into its embrace. No, we were not speechless. We continued to exchange remarks, and we were not paralysed by fear at all. We kept, but all the talking and all the moving was secondary, and the main thing was the thinking process. We were thinking intensely. Do we have a chance of fooling the English? Frankly, it didn't look like it. But by this time our luck, Atlantis's luck, had become as regular a part of our lives as the rising sun or the moon. Nothing bad could happen to us.
not to Atlantis. Silence. Only the slight creak of the ship's hull bobbing on the slow, low waves and the stomping of feet. The men restlessly treading at the guns. And I was thinking about our twenty-two victories. Twenty-two victories. Twenty-second day of the month. It's a coincidence, of course. Or maybe it's a sign? A good sign? Bad? Be that as it may, such reflections did not affect the course of events. Armed with a signal lamp captured from the British, we transmitted our name, Polyphemus, and then by radio, exactly as an innocent English ship would have done, sent a message over the air. RAR Polyphemus Rera ORE identified ship orders me to stop. RRAR Polyphemus. The chance was slim, and we knew it. But it was our only chance. So again and again we sent our desperate call for help into the ether, a hasty sequence of dots and dots. As we began our final bluff, we sought to express to the world the helpless indignation of an unjustly detained merchant ship, asking for help and support. Then came the waiting period. I wonder how the English will behave now. Broke the silence of the signalman? We soon found out. The English told us to stay where we were, so we did. Someone recalled the old blasphemous prayer of Nelson's sailors as they awaited the enemies on board Salvo. For all that lies ahead, may God make us truly thankful. Our radio went silent. Even the most myopic and totally ignorant sailor could hardly have mistaken the Devonshire for a German raider. Although our obvious deception made the enemy think the real Polyphemus really recently left Spain and could well be in the area, it became obvious that no one was going to give us the chance we so desperately needed. The British were clearly conducting a sweep, but not approaching us as we had hoped. Instead, they radioed to the Admiralty and requested data on the whereabouts of the Polyphemus. Apparently no amount of subterfuge could hide the wolf's fangs. The enemy did not let his guard down at all, and continued manoeuvring at high speed and an impressive distance. He did not approach us closer than 15,000 metres, and this far exceeded the range of all our guns and the seaplane continued to unnerve us with its presence, its buzzing curiosity seeming insatiable. Because of its prying attention, we could do nothing but move cautiously around the deck. This incessant aerial surveillance had a deleterious effect on everyone. Personally, it made me feel strangely uncomfortable. I felt like a boy who had been caught doing something reprehensible. In short, we were all secretly dreaming of the opportunity to shoot the annoying bird to hell. I wonder how we will remember if we are still alive, the strange scenery of this climactic scene of our wanderings. We stood on the bridge. The captain, the artillery officer, the torpedo officer, the navigator and myself, a gathering of naval gentlemen. All of us had undergone expensive training and gained considerable experience. But at that moment we felt helpless, like sheep being led to the slaughter. Without any hope, we watched the searchlight on the enemy ship flashing insistently. We didn't know what they wanted from us most likely a secret identification code we had no idea about. Three artillerymen, three torpedists, three signalmen were shuffling from foot to foot, waiting for orders. The most restless was the submarine commander. He was furious because he was left without a ship, and he did not know what to do with himself. He rushed back and forth on the bridge, and gradually boiling, believing that U-126 missed a brilliant chance to distinguish himself. But even in such a dramatic moment, we couldn't contain our smirks as we listened to his monologue typical of submarine. Hey, Aya, stuck on an insignificant trading vessel. After all I've been through drowning on this pathetic sucker. I feel naked, absolutely naked. What next? Rog A read unspoken question in the eyes addressed to him, and I, I have no doubt that the British will recognize. We are not Polyphemus. Then, most likely, they will show what they are really capable of. But even so... I have no intention of firing. Why not? All of us, of course, realized that our 5.9-inch guns would not be able to reach the enemy at the distance at which he persisted. We were also well aware that even if our shells could reach the target, we had no chance of standing a chance against an armored cruiser armed with 8-inch guns. But maybe just a couple of shells, Cash pleaded childishly, just to maintain prestige. No, Roggy cut him off. Maybe our bluff will succeed after all. Let's hope so. If they fire on us and we don't respond, there's a chance they'll mistake us for a supply ship. In that case, they'll probably get closer, and when they realize they're wrong, it'll be too late. So we continue to stall for time. 
There's hardly anything harder than the suspense of waiting. We couldn't afford to be wrong. Half an hour passed, and then my orderly appeared, the most respectful, and showing respect in every possible way. Hmm. Shall I have your best uniform ready, Mr. Lieutenant? Best uniform. At a time like this, I looked with bewilderment at the serious, sincere concern on the face of the man in front of me, and finally remembered the role I was to play. Whether our bluff succeeded or failed, there was another bluff. A social bluff, a bluff conditioned on a joint agreement, a bluff that both sides understood perfectly well. Hmm, of course, I replied, absolutely. It really made sense, and I woke up from my unhappy thoughts and took care of some organizational matters. The first thing I did was to ask the officer administrator to bring the dollars that we always had just for emergencies. If the ship sank, there was always the possibility, however. At this stage, it seemed highly problematic that we would make it ashore or even more problematic, be picked up by neutrals. And then the money would prove extremely useful. But where to put it? Without much thought, I stuffed the greens into my boots instead of insoles. Under more favourable circumstances, having such a sum of money could be extremely pleasurable. To money to be enjoyable, you have to have a guarantee that you will be able to spend it. My colleagues, observing my manipulations, unanimously decided that I was doing nothing. I will not swim, if I have to, in my shoes, and where's the guarantee that I'd be lucky enough to need the money? By the way, where's the submarine gone? By this time, its commander's remarks had become unprintable. Ours too, by the way. Although deep down we knew that our irritation was mostly caused not by the submarine's escape, but by our own humiliating situation, experienced sailors. We understood that the Devonshire's manoeuvres left no leeway for the submarine. How long would it take for the British suspicions to turn into certainty? We were all tired of the suspended state we were in and longed for at least some resolution. In retrospect, I think it is quite possible here to use a literary strain and say that the scene was imbued with drama. But at the time the events described were taking place, we were all too busy thinking about dramatic effects or showing cinematic emotion. There were too many pressing matters to think about. The game started at 9.35 sharp. The enemy's gun turrets lit up with bright red and yellow flashes. Cash, standing on the deck, leaned over the rail and looked down, grinning. They'll be here in twenty seconds, he announced with a final flaunt of professionalism. And then the shells whistled above us, and the water surface around us suddenly erupted in high fountains of foamy spray and steel splinters. But even in the infernal noise we could hear Roggy's thunderous voice giving the oar. Start the machines. Full speed ahead. The Atlantis began to move, but the Devonshire's shells followed, gradually tightening their grip. Raise the battle flag, Roggy commanded, and for the last time the red, white and black flag soared on the mast of the Atlantis. Our ship went into the last battle under her true colours, proud and defiant, openly accepting the challenge of the enemy. The ship shuddered, the first hit. I had heard and read about it many times, but for the first time I felt what it was like to have the deck fall away from under my feet and the wooden planking creak from the overwhelming load. Mark a smokescreen, and around us swirled acrid wisps of white fog, gradually forming an opaque wall between us and the enemy cruiser. And still his shells continued to overtake us. We made one last desperate attempt to deceive the enemy by abruptly changing course and heading southeast, perhaps if the submarine, which must be somewhere nearby, could not get the cruiser we might be able to bring the cruiser to the submarine. But the captain of the Devonshire was too smart to go along. Our manoeuvres proved futile. For several minutes, the smoke screen served only as a not-so-secure shelter for the fleeing crew. After all, a direct hit would have meant a massacre. I should note that there was no panic on board. The sailors took their places in the lifeboats calmly, as if they were going on a regular exercise. At this time, we maintained a speed of 1.5 knots, enough for the ship to obey the rudder and at the same time remained under the cover of the smoke screen. By this time, however, we could not increase our speed. The damage was too severe, although at the time I did not fully realise how severe it was. The sailors were leaving the ship, one of them carrying Ferry, who was desperately protesting, and I ran to the cabin to destroy the codes and grab my camera. I wanted to capture the end of Atlantis. I stayed in the cabin for a couple of minutes. I patted my pockets for any personal items that caught my eye, grabbed the films and the camera, and returned to the bridge. So depressingly quickly our ship had changed its appearance. 
It's always clean. Neat decks had become piles of ruined fans, fallen arrows, and all sorts of debris. Wooden shields, crates, and stanchions turned to splinters. A sickening odor of burning hung over Atlantis. Black smoke shrouded the masts like a funeral pyre. Several small fires were visible on the deck, and the hold where the seaplane had been stored was now a blazing inferno. The whole crew, with the exception of Roggy, Pigaeus, myself, and Fela and his crew, whose job it was to set and activate the charges to destroy the ship, were already in the lifeboats. On my way from the cabin to the bridge, I slipped. There was blood on the deck, I remarked. Already at the very beginning of the shelling, we had casualties. Now the death toll had risen to eight. Piggers, an old friend of Rog, who had served with him on the sailing ships, urged the captain to leave the bridge. I'm not going anywhere without you, he said, having exhausted all other arguments. Another hit, then another. The ship tilted hard to port. So this is how it happens. Atlantis was dying, and without firing a single return shot from the long-barreled guns, which were now on full display since all camouflage had long since been destroyed. They were no longer a threat to anyone and silently and doomedly stared muzzled into the sky. Our last bluff had failed, and the Devonshire, distant as hell, continued to pummel us with its powerful long-range guns. Sir and his men accomplished their mission and jumped into the water. They were followed by Piggles, who received Roggy's vow that we too would take the chance to save ourselves. Now only Rog and I were left on the ship. Trying to shout over the roar of the flames, he shout. Jump, Mofa, jump. I'm right behind you. And I jumped.